Um, it gives me great pleasure to moderate the next session. Um, there cannot be transplantation without research and development. Um, so in, from the next two speakers, we will hear about new modalities to push the, uh, the boat to increase the number of organs. So without further ado, I'd delighted to invite Professor Michael Olauson, who is from Salgrenska Academy in Gothenburg, to talk, us, to, talk to us about reconditioning of kidneys to increase the number of transplants. Michael. Yes, thank you. Uh, this was the um, uh, Swedish title. Uh, and, and yesterday I asked, uh, should it be in English or Swedish? Uh, uh, English, okay. Uh, and um, so um, the alternate title is this, Organ Donation After Uncontrolled Circulatory Death Outside Hospital, version 2.0. So, um, in Sweden or in the Scandinavian countries, we don't really use organs from people dying outside hospital. Uh, there are countries that are using this technology. Spain and, and France are probably the two countries that with the greatest experience. And there are actually over 2,000 patients published regarding the experience of this. And, and the results are pretty good. Uh, but the reason why we don't use this in Sweden is because the regulatory, or the laws actually, the, ethical, the ethics behind it, is not um, uh, up to a par, so to say. We cannot use this technology in Scandinavia because of the, the legal obstacles. And my guess is, that it will be very difficult, even in the future, to apply this, because even in Spain and in France, other European countries are looking at this and are, they are a little bit concerned about how they do this. Um, few transplant surgeons would accept an organ uh, that looks poorly, uh, poorly perfused. Uh, because our experience uh, tells us that if it doesn't look good, it's probably not good. Um, so after retrieval of the, uh, or procurement of the organs, as well as after the um, reperfusion of the organs in, in the patient, the looks matter. And um, we try to explain why it looks bad. Um, and it's usually we find some co-founding uh, factors in the donor, and, and uh, uh, we anticipate some problems if the organs do not look good. So this is a kidney that has been subject to four and a half hours of warm ischemia. Anybody interested in transplanting these, this kidney? No. Me neither. So um, as I said, there are countries that take care of organs, but not uh, four and a half hours warm ischemia time donors, obviously. It's very important that, cut, that we cut down on the warm ischemia. So the technology used today are focused on this. This means that um, they use normothermic regional perfusion, meaning they put in cannulas in the femorals, they start perfusion very early, actually before they even have donor consent. And this is why we are not allowed to do it in Sweden. Um, furthermore, if you have an organ that has been laying around for 60 minutes without a surgeon taking care of it, it's an unusual organ by our uh, common thought today. Very few surgeons would dare to put in a kidney after 60 minutes. So, and why is this? Well, the, our hypothesis is that after circulatory arrest, there is an increase in fibrogen levels. And uh, it, this is accumulation in the microcapillaries. And you also form fibrin and actually without activation of fibrinolysis when you die. And this is well known from cardiac arrest, patients having a heart attack, 
surviving the heart attack. It, it, it takes up to two weeks to clear all the small clots in the uh, capillary, and if the patient is, is lucky, they don't get any problems from it. So if you add red blood cells and activated platelets at reperfusion, you will actually promote this fibrin formation. And you will obstruct the microcapillaries. And our hypothesis is that this is the reason why you get ischemia reperfusion injury. This is the reason why you cannot oxygenate the tissue uh, at reperfusion. And it's an old fact, old knowledge, that uh, you don't get the damage when you take out the organ. You get the damage when you reperfuse. That's why it's called ischemia reperfusion injury. This is known for, 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 for ages. So we have been playing around with a large animal uh, project for eight years now. Uh, we use pigs and we try to mimic an out-of-hospital circulatory arrest. It goes as follows. We put the donor pigs on ventilation and then we shut off the ventilator as mean, and it usually it takes 15 minutes, and the, and the pig will go into cardiac arrest. Then we wait two hours. We do nothing. The, the pig is laying in a warm room. We wait two hours. We put some ice slush in the abdomen after two hours. And then we wait for four and a half hours again. And then we have this kidney that I don't want to transplant to the right here, right? This is how they look after four and a half hours. Not a pretty sight. Then we inject loose plasminogen in the arteries and close the, the vein and the artery. Loose plasminogen is a naturally occurring enzyme in the blood, in the plasma. And usually it's in the form of glue plasminogen. When glue plasminogen hits fibrin, it immediately converts to lys plasminogen. And lys plasminogen is 10 to 15 times more active than glue plasminogen. So we use the, the real stuff, lys plasminogen. And then we add altoplas, or tenectoplas for that case, which is a TPA, a tissue plasminogen activator. This is the same that we have in our plasma also. This is how we resolve clots in, our, in, in heart transplant, in, in heart uh, um, in cardiac infarction, and so on. Then we start perfusing these organ ex vivo. And we start by uh, increasing the pressure from 30 millimeter mercury up to 70 millimeter mercury in five minute steps. And we do this uh, with oxygenation, and we do it at 24 degrees Celsius. Then we lower the pressure to 20 millimeter mercury and the temperature to 15 degrees for three hours. The reason for this is that we believe that a slow oxygenation of the cells in a, in a slightly low pH will sort of make the cells, the mitochondria, recover. So we, we are not in a hurry. We let it take about three hours. Then we add red blood cells. We increase the pressure to 30 and the temperature to 32 and perfuse the organs for three hours. And the reason is red blood cells are the best way to uh, um, give a perfect metabolic balance uh, with the right pH and, and, and uh, uh, the kidney will do well and will start to produce urine during this phase. We also add a direct thrombin inhibitor and the platelet inhibitor and antithrombin-3 to the, the soup, so to say. Uh, and this uh, is done because we don't want to have reformation of uh, uh, um, fibrin thromb thrombi. And now we have a kidney that looks like this. Anybody wants to transplant that? Right? 
So this is uh, the, the final, uh, 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 this is how, how it, uh, we end up. And if we, try and if we perfuse a kidney like this, as I described, we can see in the, the left figure the resistance of uh, 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 the perfuse kidney. And you can see in the, in the uh, black uh, squares, these are the kidneys that are treated with the solution. And we can see that we have a, res a resistance that is 200 Woods units per liter, or per milliliter it would be 0.2, which is a, a, a very low resistance and has been proven by, by uh, others in, in clinical setting that, that, that it, it works. That's a good resistance level. If you look to the right, you will see the flow, the arterial flow, measured as milliliter per 100 gram tissue and minute. And we can see if we then achieve above 100 milliliter per 100 gram tissue and minute, we know that this will work. So then we took these kidneys with this awful warm ischemia, treated in this fashion, and we actually transplanted them into pigs. We took out the normal kidneys, transplanted um, this treated kidney. Uh, it was actually transplanted as an auto-transplant. And it's, it's a little bit complicated, so I don't want to go into this, but we found a way to take out the, the, the kidney first, put it into a donor, and then put it back after treatment, so we don't have to give immunosuppression, okay? And then we observed it for three months. Creatinine was not statistically different from kidneys transplanted as live donors. IOXOL clearance at three months were similar. And histology showed no difference between study group and live donor group. So, now we are actually going into a first-in-man study, and it will be done in Gothenburg. We are planning to start end of this year or early next year. It will be a cooperation between the emergency room, the ambulance service, and the transplant service, because these patients will be identified already when they are in the emergency room. So this will be a totally new concept of looking at donors, right? The donors will never come to uh, intensive care. They will never go to the OR uh, with full of anesthesiologists and surgeons. It will be a, need a small team. They will never go into radiology and do diagnostics. So it, it's a new concept. So we will perform the trial in two steps. First, we will use two donors, four kidneys, and try to establish that human kidneys are actually behaving like pig kidneys. Uh, I'm not worried. I think there are a lot of uh, data that shows that pigs and humans are very much alike. The second step will be eight patients chosen to establish the method uh, uh, in man. So it will be a, a, a phase one, phase 2A study, uh, 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 transferring the study from animal research to humans. So uh, we will have inclusion exclusion criteria, and that will be donors of both sex, 18 to 65 years old, no kidney disease or other intercurrent condition with renal impairment or high risk for renal impairment, no intoxication or suicide is cause for death. This is because we don't want to have any to do with the police or the coroner. Uh, we'll, we'll slow down the process. No HIV, Hep C or Hep B, like in regular donors. No malignancies. And do, doing this calculation, we estimate that it will be a donation rate of about 50 donors per million in the city of Goth Gothenburg alone. That means 30 potential donors a year. So, this is the process. It starts with advanced CPR out in the field. 
they arrive at the hospital. They give standard uh, of care, and we now have a um, um, sort um, uh, the, the ER department and the ambulance service has um, uh, um, written new guidelines for the for the, our region, and it all actually also discussed with Skåne region to, to be. And this we do because we want to have. A, a, a certificate that we have used uh, a, a certified uh, outline how we end treatment of the patients. So we come in after this is done, not before. No anticoagulation treatment is given apart from routine. If it's given, it's given, but it's, it's not a must. Time of death is noted in cases where ROSC is not achieved according to these uh, 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 um, guidelines. We will have to sample blood from the donor, uh, uh, and, it, and th this is a complicated, so it will be an eth ethical application, because we are not really allowed to take tests before the, the patient is died, but it's really a big problem to, to take tests in a patient that, that is, has been dead for a while. It, it, it's possible, but it's more cumbersome. So this will be part of the ethical application. And I can send this. I tried to get Smear interested in this project, but they were not interested. Um, um, just to say that, but this is um, a thing that, if this works, need to be corrected in law, I think, that it will be allowed to draw samples, but not send them. That would be an, an enormous uh, upside for us. The transplant unit will be contacted uh, uh, sh shortly when this patient arrives, if it's a potential patient, and we will have recipients um, activated. And we will have uh, um, abundant of time. We, we say that the transplant should be in the patient uh, not longer than 16 hours after death. So we will have time to do the donor evaluation, the virus panel, HLA typing, and cross-match. Uh, it, it will, we will have time for that. But we will have, for the study, selected patients that live within four hours of the transplant unit. So that's one of the limits for the study. But that will not be a limit uh, if this is, is successful. Um, we will insert eye slush in the abdominal cavity if the donor procurement preparations are not completed within two hours after death. We are working on non-invasive methods as well, but this um, will be also in the, uh, do in the donor consent discussion. And the retrieval of organ will be initiated within four hours of death. So, the potential benefits of this, obviously, is that we will increase organ availability for kidneys. We will potentially remove organ shortage globally for kidneys. Significantly less healthcare resources are used, uh, intensive care radiology, neuro neurology, and OR. We will reduce mortality in dialysis, which is in the US is 28%, uh, in Sweden is above 19%. We will have an increased availability for kidney transplants to elderly patients, which will increase quality of life compared to dialysis. And we think that the method can be more widely spread to third world countries, possibly. So, we have shown that kidneys from UDCD donors can be established despite warm ischemia up to four and a half hours in large animals. Ischemia perfusion is probably caused by obstruction of the arterial supply due to a formation of fibrin thrombi. And this is the reason why you get delayed growth function and primary non-function. By removing these with using lysplasmogen and a TPA and ex vivo perfusion, we can actually reconstitute the kidney function to normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Have a, have a seat, uh, please. Uh, lots of questions. I've got millions because we've done a okay, similar okay. pilot, so we can discuss <laughs> later. But I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Um, we're shifting above the diaphragm, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sandra Lindstedt from Lund, 
who is going to talk about creating new lungs for transplantation. Looks like we're going to sort all the problems today. Right. Michael, I'm going to ask you a question whilst uh, Sandra's getting ready. Um, we did a similar pilot and we were able to cannulate for NRP because patients were on the donor registry. Yeah. So would the Swedish law allow you to do that? No, not really. Uh, I, I think Ström can, or maybe some, uh, the donation uh, 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 council could, could, but I don't think you're allowed to do uh, procedures to, to promote uh, uh, to, to, to invasive procedures. Uh, this is my. So we, take. We, we took legal advice and yeah. we said, you know, there's a donor on the, the patient is on the donor registry and therefore clearly they've uh, indicated the wish to donate. And when they decided that the treatment is futile, then we're activated and we're able yeah. to cannulate. And the advantage of NRP in this particular situation was that the family could come and see the patient before we went to theater. So we, we had a lot of time yeah. there. So that's another op yeah. option. So, so we, we will actually have time for the patient because according to the ER, usually the family comes shortly yeah. after. So we will have the first just yeah. uh, consent discussion with them before we start. Any questions? Hands up who would have a kidney from Mikhail like this. I think you may have a surplus of donors. There's only one interested party. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, over to you. Looking forward to hearing about uh, lungs. Thank you very much. So all technical uh, issues solved, I hope. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation to this meeting. Uh, I was asked to talk a bit about creating new lungs for transplantation. And uh, as we all know, breeding is the most important thing. Without breeding, we die, right? So, the major obstacle in organ transplantation is the imbalance between the demand and the supply of donor organs, and that results on death on the waiting list. So, in this pool is 2,000 people. This is how many people that actually are, are needing a lung transplantation in Sweden today. But we only, use, we only do 50 a year, so who should die and who should live? So, there's a huge organ shortage. And due to that organ shortage, attempts are being made to find ways to restore function of lungs in discard, discarded for transplantation. And lungs can be discarded for uh, transplantation because prior healthy lungs, they can be damaged within the donor uh, due to neurogenic edema, infection, uh, aspiration and atelectasis. And we actually, we discard up to 80% of all the donors that are uh, available. So there are different strategies on how to approach this. So there are three big strategies, I would say. It's bioengineering, it's xenotransplantation and regeneration of declined donor lungs. So what are the challenges uh, and open questions when it comes to bioengineering lungs? Well, we have to have a scaffold. What is a scaffold? Well, a scaffold is something you can build a lung upon. And then we would need cells, right? Because, well, or do we? So uh, within bioengineering, there are different approaches on how to create those new lungs. One method is to produce a cellular scaffold by first obtaining a normal or discarded human lung and strip it from all cells and strip it for all DNA and you just have the scaffold left. That's one part. Then you can have those manufacturer scaffolds and then you use a scaffold that is completely synthetic. But you can put, combine the two also and have a, a hybrid scaffold where you have both synthetic material and biological material. So, but there's a lot of cells in the lung. Uh, and this is just a, a schematic over uh, a lung and how it can be built. So the first attempt that they would, uh, when trying to build lungs was actually to have a scaffold, strip it on all cells, put it in a, in a container, basically, with all cells that one would think that uh, a lung would need. And uh, surprisingly, that actually worked quite well, except from the vessels. And that we also need. 
So one recent example of a progress in bioengineering uh, on a hybrid scaffold is actually a 3D printing a small airways, what we did in Lund. In Lund. So we, print, we, we created a biocompatible bio ink and we created, we printed an airway with primary, primary human airway cells. And the airways actually stayed intact in vivo for one month uh, when, the, when the experiment was ended. And the cells, when we took it out, it had evidence of differentiated out to mature cells. So could we scale up? Because we need a lot of cells. Well, scaling up has been done in pigs. So this reports uh, from, from Texas, actually, a few years ago. So what they did was they took a, uh, a de-celled uh, graft and they re-celled in a bioreactor. And then they let it mature for 30 days, ex vivo, like outside the body. They put it in again and they let the pig live for two months. So this is the graft when they took it out, both the CT scan and the, um, and, and the macroscopic of it. And as you, uh, yeah, well, the lungs should not, this look a little bit more like a liver, I would say, uh, but it's, it's, it's a lung. But, so it's, I think it's a giant step, uh, uh, you know, towards bioengineering lungs, but this was not a functional lung in the end. So we have come a little bit, but not as far as we want, of course. So while senior transplantation shows a very promising field of transplantation that you will hear more about in this afternoon from Dr. Griffith. So, uh, so this has never been done actually in, in humans with lungs. But there's been a, a group in Colombia that took uh, discarded human lungs, connected them to a pig, let them circulate for three days, and actually showed that they were able to restore the function of those lungs. So all those techniques of bioengineering, they are a little bit ahead in the future, I would say, before we can use it in the, in the clinic. So before we can use it in the clinic, we have also other ways of restoring lung function. And one way of restoring lung function is to use machine perfusion as a treatment platform. So what is machine perfusion? Well, uh, it's a method that consists, well, basically you put an organ, in this case the lung, you put it in a, in a system where you can ventilate it and you can circulate it. And then you can use it as a treatment platform. And here you see a very nice normal lung in the lab. So what treatment option do we have? Well, we can target cytokines, since cytokines, they are inflammatory markers and they have been associated with uh, prognosis and early graft function during both ex vivo lung perfusion, but also post-transplantation for primary graft dysfunction. And it seems like IL-1 beta, IL-6 and IL-8, they are a good candidate for differing a good from bad graft and we don't want to put in any bad grafts. So there are if we're going to target cytokines, we, would, we could use commercial available cytokine absorption, for, for example. And that's what we did in, in this large animal study. So we had hypothesis, if we can uh, use cytokine absorption to regenerate pulmonary function in lungs declined for, for uh, transplantation. And then, well, the two big um, uh, problems in lung transplantation is that you declined for infection or you declined for uh, for um, aspiration. So, if we go with infection and we try to use a, a cytokine absorption, so what we did, we used pigs uh, and we induced lung injury with E. coli toxin. So, we got an infectious lung. Uh, and then, uh, as you can see here in the, the first sort of where we induce lung injury. So this is a, you can see the histology here. This first is a normal lung, and then is the lung after we, in, after we induced lung injury. We have a severe lung injury. And what we did afterwards, then we put them on ex vivo lung perfusion, and we treat them with cytokine absorption. In this study, we had three different groups. One group received EVLP, post and transplantation, but no cytokine absorption. We had one group that received cytokine absorption during EVLP and post transplantation, and one group that just received it post transplantation. 
So this is uh, how, the how the treated and the not treated lungs looked during ex vivo lung perfusion. So you have the treated on the top, they look a little bit lighter than the other ones, and uh, a, lung a lung should look a little bit lighter. So we also looked at cytokines because the cytokines was the one that we wanted to remove. And as you can see here, this is the plasma and in bowel fluid, that's fluid that you get from the airway, that we can see that, that the cytokine absorption had an effect. We looked at the histology afterwards and it looked rather different between the treated and not treated as you can see here. A lung should have a lot of air in it but, and should not be consolidated uh, as it looked in this picture. So, but could they sustain transplantation? So we went forward and we did a transplantation and we follow up during three days. And then we added hemoabsorption in the uh, uh, post-transplantation and that looked like this. So we, we have the little filter, we have the machine and we, uh, we put the well, filter or absorption connected to um, central, venous, uh, central catheter. So, we did succeed in lowering the cytokines uh, and in the treatment, uh, in the treatment treated animals after transplantation, as you can see here, both in plasma and in bowel fluid. And in this picture, you see the, the histology. That's basically the, the, um, uh, how the lung tissue looks like, and it looks be far better in the treated compared to not treated. During those three days, in the end of the three days, we took away the native lung and we evaluated just the transplanted lung and then uh, we could evaluate primary graft dysfunction. And primary graft dysfunction is often co is, is connected to long-term follow-up, uh, um, long-term conditions uh, in, in lung transplantation and if you get a severe primary graft dysfunction, the outcome is not as good as if you don't get primary graft dysfunction. So the treated ones uh, that got two treatments, both UNIVLP and post-transplantation, they did absolutely the best. So did we actually induce lung injury? Yes, we did. If you look at this lung that lies in the ex vivo lung perfusion, it looks quite horrible. Uh, and you can see here how we empty a lot of, of fluid from the airways. This is how all the lungs uh, uh, looked in the beginning of the, in the treatment. So we could conclude actually that, that cytokine filtration or absorption, that it had a significant effect on those harmed lungs, on those injured infections lungs, but, and that, that it could probably work also in the clinic. So, but the open questions here is, if we use it in the clinic, do we, do we take out too much? Because our patients need um, immunosuppression. But what we have started off is a clinical trial at Lund University Hospital where we uh, randomized to treatment or not treatment uh, during lung transplantation. And here is just the in initial patients, uh, just uh, two in each group, but they uh, seem to have a positive trend toward positive outcomes. And we looked at the nets, there's a neutrophils that uh, often uh, can have a bad outcome in lung transplantation. And it actually looks better for the treated one this early. So we were very interested in, in this, uh, in, uh, in this uh, result of our study that we, we want to immunolate the, the, uh, the lungs and we want, basically we would like to create that one lung fits, fits everyone. Uh, and we could get the immunomodulating effect with the cytokine absorption for the first few hours as you can see here in the lymphocytes. So, we went further on then to see if the mesenchymal stem cells, if they can be any positive effect for us. And mesenchymal stem cells, they have the effect that they, in, in the environment that they go into, they can adapt. And they don't, we don't think that they engraft, but they adapt and they can then try to heal the, or, or stabilize the cells in the way they are needed. So is this done in, in, in any other patients? Yes, it is. This is Marlene Rinders. She is um, a physician in, uh, at Erasmus, and she has a clinical trial ongoing on kidney transplant patients. And in those patients that given MSCs, she has been able to reduce the immunosuppression and uh, in those patients, and in some patients even, uh, been able to, to completely leave it out. So, is there a potential then for putting MSCs into machine perfusion? 
To test this and evaluate different cell-based therapy, we created a f uh, the following setups where we have in one arm we have pigs that we induce lung injury even e uh, with infection or with gastric aspiration. We treat them during EVLP and then we transplant. Then we have discarded human lungs also, and we put them on EVLP and we tried the, cell, uh, the same cell-based therapy. After EVLP, we cannot transplant as it is today, of course, and then we use something called precise cut lung slices. And what is that? Well, basically we fill the lung and we slice the lung and we put it in culture uh, and we can keep it there uh, up to two to four weeks and then we can have a readout both in gene expression and histology after that time. So we work with different kind of, of, uh, of MSC. Uh, the most, the most uh, common one is, is bone marrow MSCs. Uh, they are uh, widely used in other conditions. So those we extract from bone marrow and then we use them during machine perfusion. We also used uh, MSCs from amniotic fluid uh, and then we extract them from uh, uh, when, well, at a time of, 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 of delivery, and then we select them. And how do we select them? Well, we select them according to, when you look at amniotic fluid, you can find cells that are specific for lungs, that, that express um, lung tissue specific. Um, so they might be better to use in lungs. So again, we have a large animal model and we put them in the EVLP. We do a transplantation and we, we monitor them and we take away the native lung and we evaluate for primary gaff dysfunction. Again, we look at the lung injury, so we really know that we induce lung injury, as we can see in this picture before and after induction of, of lung injury, and then we treat them. So the open question is here, how many treatments, how many cells, which kind of cells, and also with the cell, what passage do we uh, think it's the most potential? But we have actually succeeded in immunomodulate the uh, lungs on EVLP, as you can see here in the, uh, in the um, you see the histology, but here in the next slide, you see the lymphocyte with a CD3 positive, which is uh, a marker for lymphocytes. Can we find the cells? Yes, we can, but we don't think that they're engrafted. We can see them here, but we can also see them if we mark them. So then we go on and transplant those long lungs. And we also found that with a specific kind of, of cells, with a specific kind of cell um, stage and uh, dose, we can actually immunomodulate the uh, lung and make it better after transplantation. We can also see it in the CD3 uh, positive cells post-transplantation, and we also have seen it in the, in the T lymphocytes, uh, circulating T lymphocytes. So we think this is really positive. Uh, of course, this has a longer way to the clinic than the uh, cytokine absorption, and perhaps we can have a, a, a prolonged immunomodulating effect. So the conclusion of, 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 of this is that the bioengineering xenotransplantation is a promising, very promising, but it lies a little bit in the future. So, regenerating of declined donor lungs, it lies closer to the clinic, and you can use machine perfusion as a treatment platform. And we think that mesenchymal stem cell and cytokine reduction is something that is really promising. We also work with net removal, but I didn't have time to comment on that. So, thank you so much for listening. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Any burning questions for Sandra? We're running slightly late. I think you silenced all of us, you know, it's uh, a lot of food for thought. So we'll look forward to the next evolution. Thank you both. I think fantastic ways of increasing uh, organ availability and uh, hopefully we'll have them off the shelf next time. Mm -hmm. Next time. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. And uh, now over back to Penilla for the next session. Life is a transplant. I like that.
I'm not sure. Yeah? No, it's good. Thank you. Our collaboration partner uh, for Focus Patient, um, um, beside ESOT as a, as a big organization and for, uh, for professionals, Livet som gåva, Life as a Gift, is a um, uh, combined organization between patients and professionals. And um, an overarching, maybe, organization for, for these uh, issues. Um, and I think, really, the name of the organization is uh, all, what it's all about. Life as a gift. Livet som gåva. Att man har fått ett, en ny chans, ett nytt liv som transplanterad. New life, a new chance as a transplanted person uh, to have a new life, new possibilities. Uh, and um, I do think that uh, uh, Andrea Sukuman really uh, put a finger on, on uh, something very important things. And um, what we have also discovered here in Sweden, and uh, uh, as I also represent in this case, I have many hats, uh, <laughs> the patient organization Viking for heart and lung transplanted. Uh, and we have discussed sometimes that even though you are grateful, um, you see the opportunities, and, and uh, yeah, people are always think or oh, when, when they meet you that, oh, how fascinating! Oh, you have been transplanted. How did that happen? And everything about that, and it is. I could say that every day I wake up and really feel grateful. But you cannot always think that it is that positive. You don't always wake up with a smile on your face and think that life is wonderful. Because also the immune uh, suppression um, makes some remarks in your life. The side effects are not that funny. Growth of hair for some people. Um, the bone structure is weakened, osteoporosis. Um, and there are a lot of side effects uh, from, from your treatment. Um, and I think also, when I change back my, my hat to focus patient, that there is something that our community is not really fighting for, as others are doing in their own diagnosis. Who would settle with the same immunosuppressive uh, um, uh, drugs years after years after years with less side effects? In cardiovascular diseases or, or cancer and so on, we're always talking about new innovative drugs, faster lanes for, uh, for um, uh, having them uh, accepted and approved. Uh, but in this community, we are seldom or never talk about this. And I don't know if, the, if it is because we are supposed to be always grateful. Do you know what I mean? And I think, in a certain way, we all should be grateful. Every day is a gift, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> no, no matter if you are transplanted or not, but you should always see every day as something that you could do something good of. But what we shall listen to, to here in, in this session is um, a patient view from some representatives. And uh, we will also have three shorter introductions to this subject. Uh, to see what is really going on in this area, to bring us some knowledge also. Rejection is something that I think every, at least when you have done a transplantation very recently, is something that you are very afraid of. And um, with Dennis, with, with, um, will show us something new, to use artificial intelligence uh, to uh, earlier, at least, 
uh, try to detect rejection. So the floor is yours, Dennis. Do you hear me? Okay. So uh, I only pre only prepare this presentation in Swedish, so I'm going to hold <laughs> hold it in Swedish. Uh, so excuse me for any foreign representatives here. Uh, jag ska presentera min forskning att bättre kunna förutse och identifiera tendenser till reaktion med hjälp av AI. Uh, min namn är Dennis Medved. Jag har en doktor i datavetenskap i i Lund och tillhör forskningsgruppen som Johan Nilsson leder där nere där vi försöker förbättra olika aspekter av hjärttransplantation med hjälp av AI och maskininlärning. Eh, varför är detta intressant? Eh, jo, som ni många vet här är hjärttransplantation huvudbehandlingsmetoden för det som drabbas av gravt hjärtfel. Eh, och reaktion av organ efter transplantation kan ske upp till en tredjedel av patienterna under deras livstid efter transplantationen. Eh, frekventa biopsier av hjärtmuskulaturen krävs för att kunna estimera bortstödningsgraden och eh, anpassa medicineringen av patienterna ut, utifrån det. Och som många vet så är biopsier en rätt invasiv operation och det kostar rätt mycket pengar att utföra biopsier. Hur, hur skör, sköts bedömningen nu för tiden? Eh, jo, eh, biopsierna tas från patienten och de monteras på objektivglas. Eh, och sen bedömer patologen utifrån eh, vissa kriterier och sin erfarenhet eh, eh, bortsättningsgraden. Och den brukar vara i en fyrgradig skala från 0 till 3. Där 0 är ingen reaktion och 3 är akut reaktion. Det är, tyvärr så är det rätt dålig sammanstämmighet mellan patologer mellan, eh, mellan patologer. Om man ger två patologer samma prov så är det kanske bara 60-70% sannolikhet att de eh, skulle ge samma reaktionsgrad på provet. Och det är ännu sämre för de högre reaktionsklasserna, 2R och 3R, där det är kanske bara 30% samstämmighet. Eh, vilket gör att det här problemet inte är helt trivialt för en människa att lösa i alla fall. Och hur vill vi lösa det? Jo, vi vill använda djup maskininlärning. Och det är maskininlärning som är baserad på hur hjärnan, hjärnan uppbyggd. I princip så består hjärnan av ett system av flera neurala nätverk som samarbetar tillsammans med varandra. Och det finns artificiella versioner av sådana neurala nätverk där man kopplar artificiella neuroner i flera lager. Och i djup maskininlärning eh, så kopplas många lager ihop och vår modell har ungefär 800 lager. Eh, och den här har applikation inom många olika fält, till exempel datorseende, automatisk översättning och medicindesign. Eh, hur ser vår pipeline ut? Jo, först så ta, tas biopsin på patienten, eh, placeras på objektivglas och sen scannar vi in objektivglaset. Eh, sen extraherar vi 20 och 40 gånger zoom från eh, de här BPC-bilderna. Eh, för det är de som innehåller mest eh, information eh, i en standard eh, inskanning av eh, objektivglasen. Eh, och sen beskär vi bilderna i mindre kvadrater för att nästan alla maskininlärningsmodeller har en fixerad inputstorlek. Eh, och sen filtrerar vi bort kvadrater som inte innehåller vävnad. Eh, för om man kollar på som objektivglaset där eh, så är stor del av objektivglaset eh, vit, vit eller grå bakgrundsbild eh, utan någon direkt vävnad på. Så att, det är vi inte intresserade av utan vi filtrerar bort dem. Och sen använder vi kvadraterna som input till en neural nätverksmodell som ger ut massa sannolikheter för eh, reaktioner för de olika kvadraterna. Sen använder vi en annan modell för att kombinera ihop eh, de här sannolikheterna. Eh, och, och den understa raden syns inte där, men sen eh, använder, vi, använder vi den här modellen för att eh, till slut eh, klassificera patienten som antingen 0, 1, 2 eller 3 är. 
Den nuvarande state of art-lösningen, vi känner bara till en annan grupp som har utnått liknande arbete som oss. De hade en relativt enkel modell med handgjorda features som de hade in i en SVM-modell. De fick 66% accuracy på att korrekt klassificera patienterna. Vår nuvarande modell har 91% på valideringsdatan och 77% på testdatan. Och testdatan är oberoende data som är taget senare. Då får man tänka på att testdatan har en annan distribution än träningsdatan. Och vi, har utvärderat, vi har utvärderat den här modellen med hjälp av finansiering från Vikingfonden. Och lite framtida arbete. Det är att se ifall man kan utnyttja de här modellerna för att se om det går att korrelera biopsibilderna med utfallet för patienten, till exempel överlevnad. Och se ifall det går att se något mönster i bilderna från de olika reaktionsgraderna och vilken av kvadraterna som är mest signifikanta för prediktionen och se ifall de kvadraterna kanske innehåller mönster som inte tidigare är kända för patologerna. Och vår modell är relativt agnostisk för vilken typ av vävnad man kan ta in i den. Så att I princip så borde vår modell fungera för njura och lunga och så vidare också. Till skillnad från den state of the art-modellen som hade handgjorda features. Typ. Yes, det var min presentation. Tack så mycket. Tack så mycket Dennis och vi återkommer till dig sen. Så vi ses snart igen men vi ska först lyssna på Petter Björkvist som ska ta oss vidare genom en annan del av det här som kan vara intressant för oss som också är transplanterade och tänka också på för andra som kommer att bli det individualiserade organ ja, och som kanske vi, in, så vi inte behöver ta de här immunosuppressiva läkemedlen. Det låter ju toppen på något vis, känns det som. Och det hörde vi Sandra tror jag också nämnde. Så att varsågod, Petter. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Uh, so I'm Petter, I'm a biologist, I'm a scientist and I'm an entrepreneur. I have two red threads in my career, that is cardiovascular diseases and regenerative medicine. First of all, thank you Pernilla for inviting me to this absolutely fantastic day. The reason why I'm here today, I guess, is that what I'm doing is now really coming into reality. So this slide is from, or this photograph is from Spain. And as you can see, it's from January this year. So after many years of hard struggling, we are suddenly seeing uh, the day when the first personalized vascular graft is implanted in a human being in a clinical trial. I will come back to that. So um, the journey. I'm from a company called Veragraft. We are from Gothenburg and uh, the history started more than 10 years ago in the academia and in the hospital in Gothenburg where some scientists and, and doctors were very early out and uh, believed in the technology I will talk to you about now. One of them was Professor Mikael Olausson, who you heard a few minutes ago. So I came on board in 2014 and um, from from 14 to this year we have run a very careful preclinical program that are ending up in where we are today so i said that one of my red threads is um, regenerative medicine as you may know this is a lobster and uh, in the autumn in sweden or sorry in gothenburg we are not hunting moose we are not eating sushrumming we are eating lobsters but that's not the reason why I'm showing you a lobster. A lobster is a very good example of regenerative medicine. As you may know, if you break off a claw of a lobster, they will grow out a new claw. 
Unfortunately, if you are um, a bit uh, careless with your chainsaw and cut your arm off, they will not grow out a new arm of you. So we need help. And we have seen a lot of this in the literature and we have heard it several times already today about bioprinting. I'm a strong believer in bioprinting. I really think that will change uh, medicine in the future. But please remember, this is not today. It will take uh, a few decades before we can bioprint a heart and transplant that to human, I believe. So what can we do? We are not creating new organs in my organization, but we are personalizing it and making them clinically useful. And I will tell you how. We have heard a lot about livers, kidneys, um, hearts, and those organs, the vital organs that you can't live without, we are eagerly transplanting today. But there is a price, and we heard it just a few minutes ago, that the price of living on immunosuppressive agents is a bit of a tough one. But we, we easily accept that when it comes to a vital organ. But a lot of other organs uh, that we can live uh, without, but with a limited life, we tend to uh, balance the, the life on immunosuppressive agents to avoid trans, uh, transplanting. So, how can we do uh, what we are doing? We are basically changing the identity of a tissue and organ. As you see, this is a donor, it's a blue guy. Um, and we apply something that we heard from Sandra, I think. You take off what makes an identity, and if you generalize that, uh, cells and DNA. You take that off, you end up with a scaffold, and this scaffold is the perfect building block of a new organ. So we do that. We, we use material from the donor. We heard a lot about stem cells, and I think stem cells are fantastic tools, but to use purified stem cells has an industrial or commercial backside because it's very uh, uh, time-consuming, expensive, and regulatory-wise, it's a nightmare to work with pure population of stem cells. We are not doing anything of that. We take the blood from the patient and make a solution of that blood. Then we use that solution with some enhance, uh, enhancing agents, and we, uh, we put that together with a scaffold. And out comes sort of a, uh, the same organ, but with a new identity. And the good thing here that we are uh, exploring in my company is that this process is very uh, cheap and lean and uncomplicated. So we can do the personalization process in one week compared to many months when you talk about pure population of cells. So we have started the clinical journey and we started this here. Our bodies are full of uh, blood vessels, but in the tire groin region we have veins that are having a certain function of, of taking the blood back to the heart. But there is also a valve function here. As you can see, the blood should be able to, with the muscle pump, go back to the heart. But since we are animals on two legs, it tends to go down by gravity. But this valve is functioning and closing when the blood is trying to go down. But if these valves are damaged, we are in a bit of a trouble because we don't have this uh, valve um, providing the blood of going down. Unfortunately for the patients um, with a disease called chronic venous insufficiency, it's starting with swelling and pain of the legs, but gradually these type of really terrible things are, are being formed. As you can understand, these patients are suffering, they are very often on sick leave, early retirement, etc. So we are trying to do something there. And this is our simple product. Uh, basically, we take a donated piece of a vein with functional valve, we change the identity, and then we can transplant without the need of immunosuppressive agents. And this is actually a very short video of the, the same thing. This is our product. That is what we have transplanted now to the first human beings. I guess you can even see the valves working here. So I'm soon finished. Just to tell you that this is the first in man trial, only 15 patients. We are a bit into the trial now. The first patient has now lived with a new graft for nine months. And this is absolutely fantastic. We talked about life as a gift. And for me, that is not the person with a transplant. I really think this is fantastic to see this happen now. So just to, to tease you that 
the technology we are exploring can be used on other uh, tissues as well. We have uh, a handful of other programs, arteries, one example, or nerves, yet another uh, example. We don't have time to go into that. So this, um, these studies and my company are financed by some investors, but also with a lot of governmental and EU money over the years. So that was uh, that from me. And again, the lobster. And if we all agree that this is good, we can try to regenerate uh, our bodies like the lobster. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Um, I, I really felt the arm, you know. <laughs> um, Anna, uh, you will be talking uh, about uh, drug adherence. Och det är ju faktiskt så att även vi patienter då eh, måste ju följa de föreskrifter vi får med våra läkemedel. Annars är det ju inte så stor idé att, att faktiskt ha blivit transplanterat heller. Och det sägs Anna att det slarvas en hel del på det här området. Det ska bli jättespännande att höra eh, vad du har att berätta. Thank Where you so much. Um, I decided uh, one second ago to <laughs> give this presentation in English, but the slides will be in Swedish. But it's nice for the international guests to follow my presentation. Uh, and I would like to start by saying that it's uh, both an honor and a pleasure to be here and to be invited to this extraordinary meeting. Uh, my compliments to you. Uh, and the question on this slide in English is, should the patient do as they are told by us? Because that's a long tradition in healthcare that we tend to um, talk like that. Why isn't the patient do as he or she is told? Uh, I have been a nurse for 30 years and I'm today a professor in uh, transplant nursing at Lund University since almost 10 years. Um, and I want to share with you that I think the whole patient concept is problematic. I think that we are all persons uh, and sometimes in our lives we uh, struggle with uh, acute or chronic illness or disease that needs some sort of treatment. But we are all persons. But when we become ill uh, at any point in life, we become suddenly patients, which is a very <laughs> difficult construct to adapt to. As persons, we are driven by motives. We want to achieve our goals in life. We want to be as healthy as possible. We want to, to um, be um, socially active, to be socially integrated with family and friends. And uh, as motive-driven persons, we uh, try to uh, maintain goal-driven actions. We do many things, uh, we perform activities in order to achieve our goals. And the key goal is not to be a patient. Uh, it's mainly to have a good everyday life as a person. Um, and we have a sort of ideal perspective on ourselves, which involves the person that we want to be. In my case, I want to be uh, a good professor. I am a mother of three children. I want to be able to... Um, um, engage in my friends and my, my, my social life. And we also have this uh, current um, uh, state where we are perhaps a little bit ill or perhaps uh, fatigued or whatever we are suffering from. Um, and we also have a sort of repertoire where we have a lot of actions. We have a toolbox, hopefully quite advanced toolbox, where we have different tools that we can use in everyday life. And some persons don't have this extended toolbox and we need to provide the tools. So, uh, in, um, you know, as a concept, we talk about adherence or non-adherence. But basically, in everyday clinical practice, we say the patient is not do doing as he or she is to told. Uh, and we have, uh, as healthcare professionals, difficulties to understand the reason behind that. And there are a lot of concepts involved in this area. Uh, we can talk about compliance, which we shouldn't do. It's a very dated uh, concept. We should leave that. Uh, it stems from the military, and it actually means that the, the, the person in front of us should follow our orders. 
uh, adherence. It's the most common term in, in healthcare. We can also talk about uh, concordance, which means that we would like to create an equal relationship, a partnership with the patient, which is also very much in line with person-centered care, which is the most hot topic in Swedish healthcare, at least. And then there is the concept uh, therapeutic alliance, which actually is the most, um, I think, the best concept and it's most uh, linked to person-centered care because it means that we are open and that we are really curious and, and we want to understand the patient's perspective. Um, what is important to understand as, I mean, you uh, in the role of patients, you know this already. But as healthcare professionals, we need to um, remind ourselves all the time that we are in completely different settings, completely different worlds. We are not at the same planet in the solar system, okay? Uh, and um, the mission is not for the patient to uh, uh, mainly understand our world or our perspective, but the mission instead is for us as healthcare professionals to understand the perspective of the patients. Uh, and we understand disease, for example, in a complete different way. We understand symptoms in a complete different ways and side effects of the medication. And they have complete different meaning. As a patient, as a person becoming a patient, when you have side effects, suffer from symptoms and complications, it affects your everyday life completely. It affects your relationships, your quality of life, your life satisfaction. As a professional, we talk about symptoms and side effects in an intellectual manner, but it doesn't affect our everyday life. Uh, and we really need to understand the everyday life of the patient. Uh, a lot of, of uh, research has focusing on um, what's wrong, <laughs> what's wrong with the patients. No, don't taking the medicines. Um, uh, and we, there are no specific correlations between non-adherence and specific characteristics, for example. Uh, anyone in this room can be non-adherent. Uh, sometimes, uh, from time to time, I become a patient because I have asthma. And I go to the care central and I become the asthma patient. And I meet the asthma nurse. And she looks at me <laughs> and she says, are you taking your inhalations? And I try to behave like a proper patient and lie to her. And I say, every day. <laughs> Twice, she said with a question mark. <clears throat> Maybe once a week. <laughs> Please don't be angry. Uh, being a person with an illness is not the same. It's a totally different experience from being a professional. Uh, what we know from research, we know a lot from research. This is just a few examples. Um, uh, we know a lot about non-adherence. It, um, uh, it says that medication affects your self-concept. Um, and the way you view yourself. Uh, you, uh, um, this, there is a quotation in Swedish, you're not yourself when you take medicines. Uh, you don't want to be a pill person who takes a lot of pills. Um, and some people who are on, on chronic medication, they, they try to avoid, you know, uh, to sort of, they are in a sort of denial where they try to avoid the fact that they need this medication. So, what we call non adherence is actually a personal. A statement, a personal decision where you try to adapt the consequences of the medication uh, for your everyday life. Older people in one study showed that they use so-called so intelligent compliance or intelligent non-adherence where they really try to figure out the best way to do this in order to have as few side effects as possible. Uh, and I find the, the last point very important because it says that persons on chronic medications actually are self-regulating. And I usually give the example of one liver transplant recipient I met once, I, I will always remember him, a very nice gentleman. 
and he approached me in the corridor at Sargenska University Hospital where I'm trained. And he said, and he looked at me <laughs> in a very peculiar way and he said, um, you see, Anna, <clears throat> I take my medication, my immunosuppressive medication, every other day. What do you think about that? <laughs> and I heard myself, as a proper nurse, say, interesting. Could you tell me some more about that? And it was uh, obvious that he was self-regulating and that he uh, made a risk-benefit analysis, a personal risk-benefit analysis, uh, in relation to the side effects and decided that if he takes his immunosuppressive medication every other day, he can uh, perform his right thing when he's not taking his medication, he was a journalist, and when he takes his medication, he, it's imp what was impossible for him to work. And keep up his work was important to him. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, persons who become patients, including myself, uh, we uh, tend to use self-regulating strategies. We, try to te we tend to test if the uh, illness is there, if we stop with the medication. If I don't take my asthma medication, I will certainly realize, at least, uh, latest in December, when I have the worst winter cold, that uh, the uh, disease is there. Um, we, want, we don't want to be dependent on medications. We try to avoid being pointed out at being sick or, or, you know, we want to be as everybody else. And uh, you adjust the medication to a level where you also can be a part of your social life and maintain your social activities. So, in conclusion, uh, my statement, and which I really believe in this statement, is that non-adherence uh, it's not particularly a mindset or a characteristic of you as a person, but it's, about, it's an inevitable collision between the clinical values that we as professionals set, where we want everyone to fit the profile, which is a profile that we decide based on uh, the perspective that one size fits all, and conquering worlds uh, of uh, involving work, involving leisure, family life, and uh, friendship. And it's up to us as healthcare professionals to understand this and to change the way we approach the organ recipients and their chronic medication, which is really a challenge. And I am hugely impressed how uh, you manage year after year to deal with this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, I think that if you stay yeah. about that table, and, and Dennis also, and, and Petter will join us uh, at that table, and we will bring up our patient representatives. Tar upp våra patientrepresentanter här nu också som ska få reagera, reflektera på det som våra tre medverkande har sagt. Och jag kan berätta vilka de är när de sätter sig här allt eftersom. Annette von Kock, ordförande för Riksföreningen Viking för hjärt- och lungtransplanterade. Och vi har... Ska vi se? Vi är snart på gång här. Vi har Björn Elin som är ordförande för Sveriges diabetesorganisation. Så är det rätt nu? Svenska Diabetesförbundet. Jag kan inte översätta från engelska uppenbarligen. Det lät bra. Välkommen. Och sen har vi ju då förstås Håkan Hedman, ordförande i Njurförbundet. Och dessutom har vi Thomas Andersson som är vice ordförande i patientföreningen för lungfibros. Och eh, ni får skicka den här mikrofonen emellan er. Men jag tänkte höra först eh, om det finns någon eh, reflektion hos er som ni tänkte direkt kring det här med både hur man tänker kring alltså, ja, men möjligheten till 
ny, nya sätt att få organ helt enkelt. Eh, det som bland annat då Petter kom in på här med sin forskning och utveckling i företaget. Eh, följsamheten till sin medicinering som ju i många fall ändå som vi, vi brukar säga att det är ganska livsviktigt ändå. <laughs> ganska <laughs> Hyfsat bra. Eh, och eh, sen har vi ju Dennis då, som just jobbar med att faktiskt förutsäga bättre kring det här med risken för avstötning och så. Hur tänker ni kring det här? Någon som vill börja? Jag har varit i 37 år nu jag fick min ur 1985 som jag berättade här så att jag har följt den här utvecklingen ganska länge här och det är ju en tycker jag var väldigt intressant utveckling och det som presenterades idag tycker jag var mycket in- intressant man ser på framtiden för att det man hoppas på som transplanterar det är ju här att, att man ska komma fram nya läkemedel att inga läkemedel alls behövs mot avstötning för att det är ju det som är dilemma. Jag tror du antydde det också Pernilla här att man är rädd för biverkningar och det är klart att man, man vet ju att de läkemedel man får på sikt har biverkningar och det som jag länge har efterlyst det är ju att hitta någon ersättning för kortisonen till exempel, för det har jag ju sett att det ger i biverkningar och det har gett mig biverkningar också här eh, så jag behöver ha lite hjälp med det här för att kunna röra mig och så vidare och det är ju, det är ju sånt som, som har påverkats av de läkemedel som har haft däremot fungerar min ur alldeles utmärkt och eh, den har ju gett mig som sagt har ett, ett väldigt bra liv under, under alla de här åren som jag har varit transplanterad och gör fortfarande men som sagt, det är väldigt roligt att se vad framtiden kan ge här och att det pågår en utveckling och en forskning. Det tycker jag var väldigt intressant att se under den här, det som har varit under den här dagen. Kan vi skicka till Björn där? Som, för du representerar ju en organisation för diabetiker. Och för det måste ju också finnas ganska mycket förebyggande arbete, tänker jag, så man inte behöver transplanteras också. Precis, för när jag kommer till diabetes då handlar det ju om att eh, diabetesbehandlingen inte har fungerat och att man har fått komplikationer, behöver ny, ny njure och också då kan eh, få transplantation av bukbörtkörteln och då slippa ta insulin. Så att där handlar det mycket om, eh, och där ser vi också att det är inte alltid som eh, det går att förebygga fullt ut heller. För det handlar ju mycket om från person till person också hur fungerar behandlingen redan innan. Och här ser vi också många som upplever det också att ja, men efter man har blivit transplanterad de har ju haft så mycket problem innan där också att det underlättar med alla de biverkningar som är med transplantationen för det är mycket lättare att hantera det än så som det var innan. Och samtidigt som det är väldigt intressant att höra hur forskningen går framåt idag också. Och just det här med följsamheten också. För där hör vi ju mycket personer med diabetes så att följsamheten varierar just på grund av biverkningar bland annat. Jag tänker på Petter där. Alltså det här med att forska fram någonting så det inte skulle krävas ens några sådana här mediciner. Vad ska Anna forska på då? <laughs> <laughs> Nej men alltså just det, med kontakten med patienter, hur, hur har ni lyssnat in det? När det gäller det här behovet ändå, för många uttrycker ju just att det här med biverkningar och Alltså, är, är väldigt besvärligt ändå för många. Ja, alltså vi, vi hade naturligtvis en massa val att göra. Vi är ett litet företag och vi kunde inte satsa på allt eh, på en gång. Vi har gjort väl två tydliga val. Det ena som kanske är de dåliga nyheterna för, för vissa av er det är ju att alla de här nya teknikerna de är ju lättare att applicera på enkla organ som ett blodkäll eller en nerv eller en bit hud jämfört med ett hjärta eller en, en lever eller en djure. Så många bolag som av min typ startar väl med de enklaste organen. Och vi valde ju då av historiska skäl att börja med blodkäll för det hade de som låg bakom teknologin jobbat med. Men även när man ställs in för frågan blodkäll så finns det ju hundratals olika blodkäll i kroppen och olika platser. Och då valde vi en indikation som inte behandlas eller där man inte har någon bot av patienterna idag. Kronisk venös insufficiens. Alla de patienterna i princip de skickas hem med sårvård, stödstrumpor, salvor och så vidare och har ingen utsikt att bli bra. Och den enkla anledningen idag är att eh, liv med tunga immunsuppressiva medel är 
ett ännu sämre alternativ. Mm. Och då vill vi såklart hjälpa dem så att man kan leva ett liv både med sitt nya organ och utan immunosuppressiva medel. Och det är det vi försöker göra och det ser vi väldigt lovande ut. Mm. Annette, du som har gjort två transplantationer. Ja, som lungtransplanterad så fick jag en lunga vid första tillfället och det är 18 år sedan nu. Och sen så blev det en andra lunga för åtta år sedan. Men under de här åren så tycker jag att det har hänt ganska mycket inom transplantation rent generellt. Och jag tycker att varit rent generellt idag här så har det varit många, liksom ett nytt hopp på något sätt. För att det var min reaktion vid första transplantationen för 18 år sedan. Att det kan vara mycket biverkningar och det kan hända olika saker, vilket jag har varit med om också. Men det känns som ett hopp för framtiden för de som transplanteras efter mig, för att jag kanske inte kommer att få uppleva det hela i det här läget. Men det jag tänker nu, det som jag hörde, att lungor är ju svårt många gånger att kanske göra på artificiell väg. Men det jag tänker att man började inte transplantera lungor när man började med transplantation, utan man började med helt andra organ som var lättare att hantera. Så att så småningom så kommer det också leda till att till exempel att kanske lungtransplanterade inte behöver de doserna åtminstone av immunsuppression och andra läkemedel som kommer till det eftersom det blir biverkningar av läkemedel också. Alltså det blir en följdverkan. Och det är ju det som är vår största utmaning att kunna hantera det och veta hur vi ska modulera. Och då, det som krävs mycket det är rent generellt också att man behöver en bra kommunikation med vården och att vården som man då har kontakt med verkligen känner till patienten på ett bra sätt. Annars så kan det fallera för att man kan inte gå till vilken läkare som helst som då ska försöka rätta till någonting för att då kan det stöta på patrull. Så att det, det är väl en, en liten sammanfattning. Mm. Som så. Då skulle jag passa den vidare till Thomas där och ställa frågan. Nu när det har varit pandemi och den existerar ju faktiskt fortfarande också. Så för just det här med risken för avstötning som vi hörde just Dennis prata om och så. Hur, hur har era medlemmar funderat kring det här med just att alltså, när man har ett, ett lågt eller sänkt immunförsvar så är man ju en riskgrupp och man ska akta sig för massa olika saker har man fått lära sig också och, och med all rätta och så. Men hur resonerar ni hos er? Ja, jag ska fast... För där har ju också medicineringen betydelse tänker jag. Ja, absolut. Och jag är ju inte själv transplanterad men jag representerar ju vår patientgrupp då som eh, det jag har fått fram med de här, den här problematiken är ju att, att dels under pandemin så var vi ju faktiskt väldigt expen... Vi, vi höll oss på hemmaplan och var väldigt försiktiga så det gick väl ändå över förväntan. Men det har ju ställt till det både gentemot vården för vi ligger ju tveklöst långt långt efter och som ni innan har berättat så är det ju väldigt ont om organ så att... Våra medlemmar blir ju lite förskräckta när man får till sig att eh, jag kan förstå att man måste transplantera eh, patienter som är akuta. Det har jag full förståelse för. Men pandemin har medfört en ny grupp av patienter som, som behöver transplantation. Så att eh, vi, vi, eh, vi brottas ju mot en problematik där för att kunna komma fram och våra patienter eller de som jag har pratat med i våran vi har en Facebookgrupp som är sluten där vi är ungefär 500 patienter och närstående som ja, jag bedömer att det är runt kring 25 stycken som är transplanterade men det var tyvärr bara sex som ville svara på de frågor som jag ställde inför det här då va? och det är tre saker som utkristalliserar sig för det första är de oerhört nöjda och tacksamma för den eh, vård de fick för transplantationen, vården under transplantationen och veckorna efter det fungerar klockrent rakt av, oavsett om de transplanterade i Lund eller Salgrenska och sådär. Men efter perioden, där kommer problemen. Och det, det är tyvärr så, utav alla de här sex så hade de ungefär samma 
Fast de har lite olika utfall. Men det som skrämmer mig mest är en kvinna från Mellansverige som gick den här vägen igenom och kom hem och var hemma och tog sina mediciner. Och så tillstötte det ju en lunginflammation. Inget konstigt i och för sig kanske, för det är väl, men det är ju inte bra. Hon visste inte, nu vet inte jag, jag är kanske inte rätt man att, att tala om det, men hur, returer, hur man ska gå till vägen. Men hon söker i alla fall via akuten för att vara jättesjuk. De tar emot henne, de lägger in henne på lungavdelningen på detta sjukhuset. Som till lika är en covidavdelning. Och ja, det kan ju alla förstå vad som hände där. Hon fick alltså en jättekovid-infektion som tog 53 dagar att häva. Där undrar jag om det finns riktlinjer hur man ska göra ut i sjukvården. För det här bör inte hända tycker jag. Det är, det är lite skrämmande. Det är kanske är någonting vi ska ta upp senare ja, då i den precis. här panelen som kommer här. För att, ja. och vi har ju många som just jobbar inom det här segmentet så att jag tror nog att man kan fundera över det. Hur, hur kontakten också mellan de olika vårdgivarna, eller inte vårdgivarna i sig men inom vården fungerar. Ja. Så här. Vad säger du Anna? Jag vill gärna haka på det du säger. Det är klart att det, det, det senaste du beskrev vill jag nog bara betrakta som ett en mänskligt, alltså, ja. mänsklig faktorfel. För det, så går det ju inte till. Vi, nej. Nej. Men, men det jag vill kommentera och möta dig också det är det här som du säger med att långtids perspektiv. Att om du säger att det, det, man får jättemycket uppmärksamhet före, under och tre veckor efter. Precis. Fyra mm. kanske. Nej, jag skojar bara. Men, men, mm. Det som alla människor som jag möter som är transplanterade, du märkte att jag undvek att säga patient nu, ja. berätta för mig, europeiska som jag träffar eller i Sverige, det är det att det är en ensam resa. Är man engelsktalande så säger man it's a lonely journey. Och jag har ägnat mig, jag har forskat på personer som har tagit emot ett organ i 26 år, tror jag. Så att jag nästan vikt hela mitt liv åt det. Liksom. Och, och det är mitt intryck och jag är bekymrad över att, vi, att det behöver vara så. Jag tycker inte att det behöver vara så. Jag vill inte att det ska vara så. Jag kämpar för att det inte ska vara så. Men, men och lösningen som jag ser, den enda lösningen är att vi från vårdens sida engagerar oss mer. Inte att ni behöver knacka på dörren ännu hårdare så att säga. Va? Utan, utan vi behöver hitta ett system där vi visar mer ödmjukhet och respekt inför den utmaningen som ni lever med. Och på så vis eh, kunna hitta vägar att stötta. Och vi har jättemycket forskning idag som visar precis på den utmaningen som man står i som organmottagare. Mm. Vi behöver egentligen, nu ska jag inte avliva mitt eget forskningsprojekt, men, men, men vi vet väldigt mycket. Utan, så nästa steg är kanske inte att ta reda på ännu mer hur jobbigt det är, utan snarare vad kan vi göra för att ni ska få det så bra som möjligt då? Så jag vill bara bekräfta dig i den bilden som du har från dina medlemmar. Det är samma bild som jag har i ett svenskt och europeiskt perspektiv. Det är en ensam resa och jag beklagar det. Jag ska bara tillägga den andra frågan som verkligen de ville att jag skulle ta upp. Det är ju det här med avstötningsproblematiken då som patient. Från patientens sida sett så får jag uppfattning om att ja, man får en, en, en avstötning och man lever ju med den här både akut och ja, båda delarna av det. Där känner de sig väldigt ensamma. Ja. Mm. Och det är ju hemskt egentligen. Ja, det det. Ja. Och, det, och jag kan bekräfta det med. Vi har gjort, I min forskargrupp har vi gjort jättemycket forskning om det. Fear of graft ejection heter det på engelska. Och vi, vi vet det. Det är fruktansvärt. Det är en ovisshet som kan äta upp vissa människor. Mm. En del tänker på det varje andetag. En del tänker på när de tar sig medicin varje dag. En del spänner ögonen i mig och säger att det går inte en dag utan att jag tänker på att jag kan få en avstötning. Anna. Och jag känner bara att holy smoke vad jobbigt. Så, att, så att det är förfärligt och vi vet om det också, men vi behöver, som mina ungar säger, levla upp lite i transplantationsvården kring att möta den rädslan och ovissheten och försöka lindra den. Vi har lite upplevlande att göra. Så att säga. Det är ständigt ett kämpande med detta upplevlande, kan vi säga. Mm. 
<laughs> ja, men du kan, man kan inte stå där, sure. men nu har vi jätteont om tid, Sisse, så kom upp här nu så alla hör vad du säger. Annars så blir vi inte alls bra det här. Jag, jag har fått ett nytt hjärta och jag vill säga att jag var inte alls ensam. Jag har tre, var tredje månad nu så träffar jag min sjuksköterska mm. eller min läkare. Mm. Jag har direkt nummer till sjuksköterskorna. Jag är inte alls ensam, det är bara att ringa ett samtal. Kanon. Bra! Kanon. <laughs> Bra, Sissi! <laughs> Och då måste vi sluta på topp, förstås. Så att jag tänker så här att alla ni tre som jobbar med forskning, utveckling... Och så eh, glöm inte att ta med de här eh, patientföreträdarna för att de är otroligt viktiga för att det faktiskt ska komma fram bra saker. Eh, och eh, om jag skulle skicka runt nu bara, och nu menar jag kort. <laughs> Men vad, vad ni skulle vilja liksom skicka med, alltså Petter, Dennis och Anna här nu när ni har chansen. Mm. Håll närmare. Viking kollega här. Mm. Närmare, närmare bara. Närmare, närmare. Mm. Jo, Anna, jag håller med eh, Cecilia, min Viking kollega mm. i styrelsen, att vi behöver inte vara ensamma. Eh, dels när vården fungerar, när man får kontakt, så behöver man inte känna sig ensam utan man frågar. Och sen har vi då nätverk, alltså vi har ju Viking. Och man har andra som är i samma situation och då kan man ventilera ganska mycket och utbyta erfarenheter. Och sen så er forskning här, Petter och Dennis, den är någonting för verkligen framtiden när det gäller lungor. Och jag hoppas på den att det ska kunna leda till något gott för att just att slippa den tunga medicinering, det, det är verkligen ett mål eftersom det kan ge en hel del biverkningar. Mm. Ja, precis. Forskningen det ger ju mycket hopp för framtiden också. Både tänker jag, tillgången men också, som vi pratade precis här, om risken för bortstötningar så att kunna minska det. Och som vi pratade om med just följsamheten, att ja, men se vad är det som gör att följsamheten inte fungerar och vad är det man kan göra för att underlätta i vardagen. För ofta är det små grejer. Kanske bara det att ja, men jag ska ta mediciner och telefonen ringer och så glömmer man bort att ta den. Det kan vara väldigt små grejer som inträffar. Så se hur kan man underlätta vardagen kring alla sådana grejer som inträffar. Ja, jag, kan, jag vill lyfta då med en patientorganisation det här med gemenskapen här att man har möjlighet att träffa andra personer som är i samma situation och diskutera sin, sina problem och, och, sina, och det, det som man har gemensamt som transplanterar oavsett om man är ung eller om man är gammal. Vi har även i nyförbundet en ungdomsgrupp som är väldigt betydelsefull bland annat för ungdomar som är i samma situation där man kan tala om samma sak så att alla förstår vad man pratar om. Sen vill jag också lyfta det som alla har gjort här med forskningen. Och det är något som våra medlemmar man ser sätter väldigt högt. När vi har gjort medlemsundersökningar så är det vad man vill ha reda på. Det är resultaten av forskningen, att forskningen drivs framåt. Och det är något som vi också satsar på. Inom, och det gör ju alla patientorganisationer satsar på forskning, medicinsk forskning. Jag skulle också vilja framhålla forskningen som är viktig. Även då lunga är ju bevisning är en ganska svår sak och svår nötorna och knäcka det förstår vi också men vi hoppas ju väldigt mycket på det men det jag till sist vill säga är att, att jag hoppas att vården tar patientperspektivet tydligare än vad man kanske har gjort innan, det är jätteviktigt Tack Tack så mycket och eh, som sagt i presentationen så sa ju Dennis att han är mottagare av Vikingfondens pris men det tycker jag väl vi kan, för, kan berätta här också. Är det någon annan som vill ansöka till Vikingfonden Annette så är det väl helt okej okay att göra det. Ja, så får vi dela ut igen. Ja, det är bra. Vi vill inte bara en pristagare, vi vill ha fler. här. Så. Stort tack till panelen och de medverkande och sen är det kaffe hörni.